you enter a masjid. The first and foremost you must remember is that you're very, very lucky. Allah Azza wa has blessed you on a beautiful day like today. A lot of people, what are they doing today? They're not spending the time in the house of Allah. So Allah Azza wa has blessed you with this opportunity to come to his house, to attend the ishtama and hopefully to learn something as well. There are also many blessings in reciting through the park upon the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Ta'ala Wasallam. The final Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Ta'ala Wasallam is reported to have said, that Allah Azza wa Jalla sends 10 mercies upon whoever sends salat upon me once and an angel has been appointed to convey his salam to me. Allah Akbar. Please make a habit of reciting through the park. I know, I think it was probably about six, eight months ago, a Nigrani Shura, the head of the executive cabinet of Dawud Islam, he came to the UK and he asked people to travel in the way of Allah, that who can travel at least one month, two months, three months, six months, 12 months. And there was the odd hand that went up. Yeah, I'll travel for one month, I'll travel for two months. But then the Grand Shura, he said that whoever gives their name, I will write their name down on a piece of paper, and I will give that piece of paper to Amir al Sunnah, the founder of Dawud Islam. And all of a sudden the hand started to go up. Yeah, people say, oh yeah, I wanna go, I wanna go, and the hand started to go up. And so it kind of encouraged people to have their name to be presented in the court of a Middle Sunnah. Now what I'm saying to you is, I'm not asking you to travel in the way of Allah for one month, for two months, for three months, for six months, for 12 months. If you send Durud Park upon the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, not only will your name, but also your father's name will be presented in the court of the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So please make it part of your daily routine. Nowadays in our life, we try to talk about multitasking, how we can do two things at once, three things at once, and we try and multitask in our life. You know. Through their parks, reciting salawat upon the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. I think I've tried hard to think. There's very few things that you can do and not send through the park at the same time, unless you are talking. Like I'm talking, it's probably hard for me at the moment to send through the park upon the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But if you're working, if you're driving, if you're waiting, whatever your job is, whatever your job is. I travelled in a Madhuri Kafla to Australia once, and there was a doctor who lived in Sydney, and he worked in Newcastle, and it was about two two and a half hour drive. And I used to say to him, what are you doing them two and a half? I was just curious. I thought maybe I'll give him something to do. Or I'll, I'll give him some uh, Farzalum course so he can listen to it. He said, no, for them two and a half hours, I recite whatever Quran I know and whatever was I know. And the rest of the time I spend it in reciting the Park upon the Prophet of Allah. Oh, wow. Two and a half hours there, two and a half hours back every single day, five days a week. So you can find time. We all have time, but the problem is we can't manage our time. And as a Muslim, the one thing that we do have, no matter how rich you are, no matter how poor you are, no matter how strong you are, no matter how weak you are, old or young, whatever it is, we all have 24 hours in a day. The problem is, is we don't manage that time. We don't manage that time. But before I go on to the topic, I just want to say that if you, when you go home today, you get out your phone, a lot of people have got Android phones or maybe even Apple phones as well now. On these phones, there's a, a, there's a setting on there somewhere that can monitor your phone usage in the last seven days. And it'll tell you in the last seven days, you use your phone for this amount of time for this, for social media, for games, for this. And if you find that, the fine thing, the one thing I'm going to regret before I start about the topic of the day, one thing I'm going to request from all of you is when you go home today, look at your phone and that time that you spend on your phone, according to your phone, other than what you deem is urgent, because maybe your work relates that you need to be on WhatsApp or you need to be on a certain app because of your work. Take that to one side. The remainder of the time where you just, just, whatever you want to call it, you're just chilling or you're just taking time, you're just spreading time or passing time on the phone. 25%, I'm going to only ask for 25% of that time, 25% of that time, utilize it in either sending through the park upon the Prophet of Allah, reading the Quran or acquiring the knowledge of the deen and inshallah, you'll see a change. And when you see that your time, you think, I can't give 25%. 
You've given 100% to social media. I'm just asking for 25% today. So please, when you go home today, look at your phones, look at the time that you spend on the phones and utilize your time properly. Life is too short. Life is too short and we do not know when that time will come. And that time will come. That time will come without, without us knowing. It. And so we need to be ready for that time. And inshallah, we'll discuss that a little bit later on as well. But it is not with us and viewers on the channel. It is narrated by the companion, Sayyidina Abu Sayyid Qudri, radiyallahu ta'ala, that the final prophet of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, has declared that Ramadan is the chief of all months and the greatest is sanctity is in Zulhajjah. Another companion, Sayyidina Khab al-Abar, radiyallahu ta'ala, was known as Hifas al-Kitabain. That is because he was scholar of both the Quran and the Torah. He once said, Allah created time and four months, Zulhajjah, Zulqaeda, Muharram, and Rajab, are the most beloved times to him. From these four months, he loves Zulhajjah the most. From Zulhajjah, its initial 10 days are the most beloved to him. And Alhamdulillah, we are in these 10 days of Zulhajjah. It stated that the initial 10 days of Zulhajjah are highly blessed. They are so beloved to Allah that have even been mentioned in the Quran in which Allah Azawajal says, by oath of the dawn and by the 10 nights. And according to one opinion, the 10 nights mentioned in this verse refer to the initial 10 nights of Zulhajjah. The fact that Allah Azawajal has taken an oath by them highlights how blessed, sacred, and excellent they are. So these 10 nights, these 10 days that we've got, you know, as the Ummah of the Rasul, Ummah of the final Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in one way we are very, very lucky. That Allah Azawajal has blessed us with so many opportunities, so many opportunities to attain the pleasure of Allah. You know, if we have these first 10 days, then we have the 10 days of Muharram, then we have Shabbat Barat, Shabbat Miraj, we have the whole month of Ramadan, we have every Friday. There are so much that we are given as opportunities. You know, if you was a, I don't know, a businessman, and there's only one time in the year, like if, for example, if you're a taxi driver, so you're looking forward to the winter holidays where that is the time where, you know, a lot of people are going to be using the taxi and I'll make more money. And so people look forward to them times. As Muslims, we are fortunate that we have these times coming time and time and time again. But do we take the advantage of these times? Do we take the advantage of Shabbat Barat? Do we take the advantage of Sabi Maraj? Do we take the advantage of Ramadan? Do we take the advantage of these 10 days? These are the blessed days, the golden opportunities that we all get. And in these 10 days, the ibadat that you can do, the reward that you can get is so great. But unfortunately, it's just another day. That all of these ibadats, all of these opportunities, all of these blessings, all of these blessings, and I use the word blessings. Unfortunately, now all of these become a burden for us. Salah has become a burden for us. Fasting has become a burden for us. Zakah has become a burden for us. We're in the month of Zulhaj, Hajj has become a burden for us. All of these things have become a burden for us. But in fact, all of these are blessings for us. Salah is a golden opportunity to speak to your Rabb five times a day. Ramadan is an opportunity to gain so many rewards. Zakah is an opportunity to purify your wealth. Hajj is an opportunity, a blessed opportunity to get all of your sins removed as if, so that you come back as if the day that you were born. These are all blessings to us. But unfortunately, the ummah is now that all of these things have become a burden for us. That we find these things a hardship. We find reading the Quran a hardship. We find reading the Salah a hardship. Fasting in the month of Ramadan a hardship. Performing the Hajj a hardship. Yes, I know it's hard. I'm not saying performing Hajj is easy. But these are a blessing for you. And if Hajj is obligatory upon you, if Hajj is obligatory upon you, you need to perform it as soon as possible. The Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam warned us that if Hajj is obligatory upon you, if you are physically and financially capable to perform the Hajj, and you do not, you delay it. If you delay that, and the angel of death comes to you, then you run the risk of dying without Iman. So I know at the moment, there are only a few days left, and maybe it's virtually impossible now, for anybody who makes the intention to perform the Hajj, to go on the Hajj. But what I would say to you, if Hajj is obligatory upon you, if Hajj is further upon you now, please make a firm intention to make it next year. You know, it's not going to get cheaper. And the only reason it's obligatory upon you is because you can afford it. You know, if there was a time where Hajj was £2,000 and you've got £2,000 now, it's not obligatory upon you because that's all you've got now. But remember this, the day becomes obligatory upon you for the rest of your life is obligatory. And if you now you decide that, oh, it's Hajj is obligatory on me, but you know what, I'll go next year because I've got this kitchen extension to do. You know what, I'll do it next year because I want to buy a new car. You know, I'll do it next year because I want to get my daughter married. You know, I'll do it next year because I want to get my koti repaired back home and I'll spend all the money over there. You must perform that Hajj. Once it's become obligatory on you, you must perform it. There's no excuses, no ifs, no buts. 
And you need to say to yourself that Allah Azza wa has blessed you with that wealth. You know, you may think, oh, if I go to Pakistan, it's half the price. But it's obligatory upon you because you can afford it here. Okay? It's obligatory upon you, you can afford it here, so perform the Hajj. Coming back to these 10 days, there are no days in which Allah loves the performing of good duties more than these 10 days. The Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that these 10 days are a blessing to us. It's stated in another hadith, the reward of good deeds in these 10 days is multiplied 700 times. Multiplied 700 times. Just to put that in perspective, you know, nowadays the minimum wage is 10 pounds something. Okay. If I was to say to you, look, for these 10 days, not 10 pounds something, 7,000 pounds an hour you'll earn. Eh? 700 times more you'll earn in these 10 days. No, no, I want to watch football. No, no, I want to go out with the mates. I want to do this, I want to do that. What's going to happen? Are you going to do that? If I was to offer you for these 10 days, 7,000 pounds an hour, you're going to say no. Allah Azza wa is offering you 700 times more reward than any other normal day. So what? We're not bothered about it. It doesn't affect us. It doesn't affect us when these super duper offers, if you want to call them, come along. When the month of Ramadan comes along, when the last 10 days of Ramadan come along, when the blessed nights and potentially Laid al-Qadr comes along, when Shabai Marath comes along, when we are told that more people are forgiven than the hair and the tribe of the sheep of Bani Child, when these nights come along, does it affect us? No, we think, oh, it's just another day, isn't it? Just another day. And these days go by, these weeks go by, these months go by, these years go by, and before we know it, the angel of death comes to us. When we open up a bucket of deeds, we realized that we missed all them opportunities. Just think at the end of the month, you realize that, oh, I didn't work on them days, and that was the time to make 7,000 pounds. And how sad would you be? That if I said, look, if you'd have worked on that day, you would have made 7,000 pounds an hour. And when you get your wish, oh, I missed that day. That's what you're going to be like. On the day of judgment, that is what it's going to be like, that you have missed all of these opportunities. And that's why I say to you, as the Ummah of the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we are blessed. We are blessed with these days. The Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that there are no days more beloved to Allah that he be worshipped in than the first 10 days of Zul Hajj. Fasting on a single day from them. Fasting on a single day from them is equivalent to fasting for a whole year. So now we're not talking 70 times, we're not talking 365 times more reward. And again, how many people are going to take up the offer? And standing in there every night, staying awake to worship in these 10 days is equivalent to standing in Laylatul Qadr. Now Laylatul Qadr, we're not sure what night it is. Is it the 21st? Is it the 23rd? Is it the 25th? Is it the 27th? Is it the 29th? Have we got the right time? Have we started the right time? We don't even know. Here we are told in these 10 nights, every single night, if you do ibadat in any of these nights, it's as if you have found Laylatul Qadr. These are the blessings of these nights. This is why I'm saying to you that this is how fortunate we are. That the Ummah of the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is so fortunate that he has this. But again, are we bothered? Does it affect us? Do we take up these opportunities? Or they just pass by again and again and again? And if that is the case, then that again is a question that we need to ask. We need to ask this question that are we attached to our deen? Or has our deen become a hobby? And I've said this many times, that unfortunately a lot of people, the deen has become a hobby. Some of the people that know me know that I have a hobby for old cars. Yeah? I bought an old sports car about eight years ago. I put it in my mother's yard. I put a sheet over it. I've made an intention that one of these days, I'm going to restore that car and I'm going to drive that car. That's my hobby. One of these days, I'll get around to it. Unfortunately, our deen's become like this. If I've got time, I'll read my Salah. If I've got time, I'll read the Quran. If I've got time, I'll do this. If I've got time, I'll do that. And we put that secondary. Our deen should not be secondary. And this again is why we are failing. My dear Islam brothers and viewers of Malaysia. We put deen secondary. Deen has to be primary. And we have to take the benefits of the deen. And the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah Azza wa has blessed us with these days. Blessed us with these opportunities to take these. And again, we need to do this. Another one of the things that we do in the month of Zul Hajj, as we all know, is the Qurbani. Qurbani is again another form of worship. Again, another blessing from Allah. It is, to, it is necessary, wajib, for every adult Muslim man and woman to do so, provided they are mukim, i.e. not travelers, and they possess a stipulated went, amount of wealth, which is 52 point dollars of silver or money equivalent to it. Now, I think at the moment, 
I'm not sure the exact rate, but I think it's approximately less than seven or eight pound of tola of silver. Silver is very cheap. So you're looking at only probably about three, four hundred pound. That if you possess wealth or gold to the value of three, four hundred pound, then kurbani is wajib upon you. And I think that would cover nearly all of us. There'd be very few people that kurbani is not wajib upon in this particular country. Again, this is wajib upon us to do it. So again, I encourage you to make sure that you perform that deed. The companion Sayyidina Zahid bin Arkam, radiallahu ta'ala narrates, he said the companions of Allah's Messenger once asked, O Messenger of Allah, what are these sacrifices? He replied, they are the sunnah of your father Ibrahim al-Islam. The companions then asked, O Messenger of Allah, what do we attain from it? And he replied, for every strand of hair on the sacrificial animal, there is a reward for you. Allah Akbar. On the Eid al-Adha, the Messenger of Allah said, no person's action on this day is better than shedding blood, i.e. performing qurbani. Again, there's great blessings in performing the qurbani. So I encourage you all to please perform the qurbani. But in doing so, another thing I would like to advise you all, a lot of people, when you go out and buy some shoes, you look for the best shoes, you look for the best coat, you look for the best shirt, the best jacket, yeah? You look for the best car, you look for the best in all your life. But when it comes to the qurbani, unfortunately we look for the cheapest. Yeah. We find that country where the qurbani is the cheapest to do. Yeah. Allah Azzawajal has blessed you with wealth. Allah Azzawajal has blessed you with wealth. So if Allah Azzawajal has blessed you with that wealth, then utilize it. Don't just go for a cheap qurbani, go for the best qurbani. Go for whatever you can afford and go for that best qurbani. And try and do that to the best of your ability. And this is the blessings of this. And qurbani in itself is also an expiation of your sins. It gets rid of your sins. The Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said that whoever performs qurbani while seeking reward and with a willing heart, it will become a barrier for him against the hellfire. This qurbani is again, like I said earlier on, there are opportunities for you, there are blessings for you. Great opportunities for you. So again, don't miss that opportunity. Don't just, again, think of it as another burden. Unfortunately, again, all of these things that I'm talking to you about now, unfortunately, the Ummah now thinks all of these are burdens. Qurbani, oh no, a burden, I've got to do Qurbani this year. Why have I got to do Qurbani this year? I don't want to do Qurbani this year. Because Allah has given you the wealth, that's why you're doing Qurbani this year. If you didn't have it, it wouldn't be wajib upon you. And this again, another thing I want to reiterate, I mentioned it then, but I want to highlight it a little bit. Allah give you that wealth. Remember this. Whatever wealth you've got, Allah has given it you. You may say, well, I work hard for my wealth. I work six days a week, seven days a week, eight hours a day, 12 hours a day. I've worked really hard. You may say, look, I went, to, I went to college, I went to university. I studied for six years so I can have this job. I'm earning good money now, but I, I had to work hard for that. Who give you the strength? Who give you the strength to work eight hours a day, 10 hours a day? Who give you the intellect? intellect to be able to go and get that degree. Who give the opportunities? Who give you the resources? Who give you all these things? I look around me and I see that the majority of the people that are sitting in this room come from the Pakistan or Indian subcontinent. What is the difference between me, you, and a person sitting on a street corner in somewhere in Pakistan selling pens? And that, all, that is all he's got. What is the difference between him and me? Nothing. Nothing. Yes, the difference is Allah Azawajal has put me here. Now you may say, well, again, I struggled to get the visa, to give 10 lakh, 20 lakh priests to get here, or whatever. whatever you can say. that. But Allah gave you them opportunities to get here. So you are here through the will of Allah. The money that you have got is through the will of Allah. The health that you have got is through the will of Allah. The strength that you have got is through the will of Allah. The education that you've got is through the will of Allah. Everything that you have got is from Allah. And Allah is asking for you to give two and a half percent in zakat. Allah is asking you to do a qurbani once a year and again we find it hard to do. What a huge burden that is. And Allah is not just saying give two and a half percent from your wealth. No, He's saying give two and a half percent from your savings. And once a year of qurbani, how hard is that? At the moment, I think the, the rate for the Islamic qurbani is in the UK is 105 pound for a sheep, 65 pound for a hissa, for a share. How hard is that? You probably go out on a weekend with your mates and probably spend more than that. You probably spend more than that on your trainers or on your jacket. A tank of fuel costs more than that. Once a year, spend in the way of Allah. And this qurbani is an expiation for your sins. Allah Akbar. It is stated in the Quran 
And for every nation we have appointed a sacrifice that they should mention the name of Allah over the mute animals which He has provided them. So remember your God is one God. Submit therefore only in His majestic court and give glad tidings. Or, oh, oh beloved, to those humble ones. Again, a lot of people think, you know what, I won't do the Qurbani this year. You know what, I, I just want to, a lot of people have this mindset that in their heart they've got a little mufti. They've got a little mufti in their heart. And this little mufti in the heart seems to know better. Yeah? And this little mufti in the heart says, you know what, instead of me doing Qurbani, I think it's better if I give a hundred pounds to poor people. I think that's better. I think it's better rather than me doing a share of 65 pounds, I'll give a hundred pounds to poor people. I'll do this, I'll do that. Remove this mufti from your heart, please. Yeah? Remove this mufti from your heart. It is wajib upon you. And that wajib is not removed by spending the same amount of money and giving it to poor people. If you think giving to a poor people, you want to give someone to poor, give it to them. But at the same time, do your qurbani. Same time, do your qurbani. Yes, give that 100 pound to the poor people. Give that two, give a million pound to the poor people. But what is wajib upon you is the qurbani. Give as much as you want. You're free to give as much as you want. But make sure you fulfill your obligation. Qurbani, again, is an expression of gratitude to Allah. To thank Allah. That these things that Allah has given us, this food that Allah has given us, these animals that Allah has given us, all of these things that Allah has given us, these are all blessings from Allah. That there are animals there for us to sacrifice, there are animals there for us to eat, there are fruit and veg and all of these things, they're all blessings from Allah. And if you want to, you know, contemplate on Allah, then look around you. And as Muslims, we need to realize how fortunate we are. We're sitting in this masjid, then look around you. The carpet, what is it made of? Where did that come from? The doors, they came from trees, the plaster, what, all these things I'm looking at, plastic came from, all of these things came from blessings from Allah. All of these blessings from Allah, we have utilized them and we've made this masjid here. These clothes, everything that I have got are all blessings from Allah. They were made from raw materials that Allah gave us. And so we need to be thankful to Allah for all of the things that Allah has given us. Qurbani is also teaches us servitude. The central lesson of Qurbani is that we may become true servants of Allah and obey Him. Allah revealed Qurbani was made obligatory on every Ummah. He then revealed it as an expression of gratitude and should be performed solely for His sake. He then declared at the end of the verse and give glad tidings, O beloved, to those humble ones. In this part of the verse, Allah instructs His Prophet to give glad tidings to the paradise, the people who are humble. The people who are humble, they will get attain the paradise. This, sun, this Qurbani, as most of us know, is also the Sunnah of Sayyidina Ibrahim al Islam. Sayyidina Ibrahim al Islam, he faced loads of trials and tribulations. And if we just look at his life very briefly, at the age of seven, Sayyidina Ibrahim al Islam was commanded by Allah. He was commanded by Allah and he was said, and recall when his Lord said to him, Submit. And at the tender age of seven, Sayyidina Ibrahim al Islam replied, he humbly replied, I've submitted to the one who is the Lord of all the worlds. At the age of seven, Sayyidina Ibrahim Islam submitted these words in the court of Allah. Then he remained steadfast upon them throughout his life. He faced hardships, worries, sorrows, difficulties, but he did not waver for a single moment. Nimrud even dared to place him in a blazing fire. He put him in a blazing fire, but even then Sayyidina Ibrahim Islam remained content. He continued to obey Allah in every situation. When he was about to be placed in the fire, Sayyidina Jibreel Islam came to him and said, Oh Ibrahim, do you need anything? And he replied, I need something but not from you. Jibreel then humbly said, Kindly ask for your need from him. Meaning kindly ask from Allah. Sayyidina Ibrahim beautifully said, He is watching. So there's no need for me to say anything. He is watching, he can see me. This is the Iman that he had. This is true faith, this is tawakkal. Allah reward this certainly. And it said that that raging fire, that raging fire was turned into garden of flowers. Why? Because of his patience. And then Allah Azza instructed him to make the hijrah. He emigrated to Syria, leaving his home, relatives and everything else behind. Why? Because Allah told him to do this. And then he made a dua. He made a dua, oh my Lord, bestow upon me my righteous offspring. And at that age, he was blessed with righteous son in the form of Sayyidina Ismail al-Islam. And even when Sayyidina Ismail was a, a, a baby, at that time, Allah told him, take him to a place and leave him there. Take him to a place and leave him there. 
It was the command of Allah. It was the will of Allah. He accepted it. He took him there. He took him and in that place, he left his child there. And we hear the story, the famous story, the Safa Marava, the mother running and the child kicking. This was the child. Sayyidina Ismail and Islam was the child. These are the trials and tribulations that he had. And then when he was told to sacrifice his own son, he didn't question it. Labbaik, Ya Allah, I will do whatever you say of me. He was willing to sacrifice his son. And in place of his son, because of this act, Allah Azza wa Jal quickly replaced his son with a ram. If Allah willed, what could have happened all day? Sayyidina Ibrahim al-Islam could have sacrificed his son. And that could be the sunnah that we have to fulfill today. Today we find it hard to sacrifice a sheep. Today we find it hard to sacrifice a cow. Just think if Allah had willed that we had to sacrifice our son. That is what Sayyidina Ibrahim al -Islam was willing to do. And now we find it hard to sacrifice anything. Where is our jazbah for sacrifice gone? The people of the past, you look at the companions of the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa the sacrifices they made for the deen. You look at our pious predecessors, the sacrifices they made for the deen. You look at the prophets, the sacrifices they made for the deen. Where are we? Where are we heading? What is going to happen to the future of our ummah if this is our sacrifices? That forget everything else, we're not even willing to spend a couple of hundred pounds on a sacrifice once a year. We need to be willing to sacrifice some time. Not just money, but time as well. Time for the deen as well. I've mentioned it many, many times before, but I've not mentioned it here, so I'll mention it here as well. All the people that are sitting in this room, other than the Sayyids, and other than some individuals, and you'll understand why when I explain. Other than to the Sayyids and some individuals, if we go back in our heritage, great-grandfather, great-great-grandfather, great-great-great-great-grandfather, eventually you'll come across someone who is a non-Muslim in a lot of our cases. And our ancestors, they were either Hindus, Parsis, or whatever they were. Fire worshippers even. Could have been anything. For a moment, just for a moment, I want you to think about that day. That day that someone left their house, and he met your ancestor, and he invited them to Islam. Allah Akbar. What a beautiful day that is. You know, if I knew what that day was, I would celebrate it every year. Yeah? If I knew what that day was, I would celebrate it every year. Because because of that day, I'm a Muslim today. And it's same with you, because of that day, you are a Muslim today. Now that person that left his house and invited your ancestor to Islam, he's now resting in his dark and lonely grave. And inshallah, through the will of Allah, he will be getting the reward of all your ancestors. All of your ancestors. From then till now, till the day of judgment, he'll be getting the reward. But then for a moment think that if that person thought, you know what? Nah, I don't want to go out today. I want to chill with my friends today. I want to do this today. I want to go on a holiday today. I ain't got time for this. I ain't got time for that. I ain't got time for this. I ain't got time to do sacrifice in the way of Allah. There are other people doing it. Let the Imam Sahib do it. Let that person do it. Why should I do it? Where would me and you be today? Forget where would you and me be today. Where would this building be today? They did their job. Now it's our job. They lived in a country, more likely, where Muslims were a minority. We're living in a country where Islam is a minority. And we're still, we are living in worse times. At least that time, you look at them time and you see that the Muslims, at least they were Muslims in that sense, that they followed the deen. Nowadays, we are Muslims in name. When it comes to salah, when it comes to fasting again, we find it a burden. You know, if I was to ask people in this room, unless I can't see any scholars here, there must be, mashallah, Qari Sabz here, some scholars are here. If I was to ask the scholars in this, other than the scholars in this room, that if someone passes the way, and we talk about inheritance, a person has two brothers, two sisters, two sons, two daughters, he has these relatives, what are the shares in the inheritance? Very few people will know the answer to that question. Very few people will know the answer to that question. But if I was to ask a question to all the people in this room and all the people that are watching Madani channel now, do you know if Salah is obligatory upon you or not? How many people will say no? Everybody will know this. It's just not as if somebody's going, oh, I didn't know that. I don't know the answer to that. Everybody knows Salah is obligatory upon us. So then the question is, why not? Why are we not performing our Salah? Why have we got this mindset? that we'll worry about it later. 
Why have we got this mindset that, oh, when we're 50, when we're 60, we'll spend our time in the masjid? Why has it we got this mindset that next time? You know, when we're talking about the Hajj, as well at this time of the year, we're talking about the Hajj. When I was blessed to go on the Hajj, I noticed one difference. I don't know if, you've, if the people that have been here that have gone on the Hajj, notice the difference of the people that come from Europe and Africa and Canada, and the difference between the people that come from Pakistan and India, for example. You know, when I went there, you have these different colored bands. Okay? You have a different color band depending on where you come from, yeah? And I noticed a difference between those people that came from India and Pakistan and those of the people that came from England. Even though the people from England were originally from Pakistan as well, they had a different mentality. The people from England, when they were given an opportunity to do something to gain reward, uh, we'll do it next time. Uh, okay, we'll think about it. Okay, yeah, maybe next time. It was those people that came from Pakistan and India, they knew that this was a once in a lifetime opportunity. They didn't miss any opportunities. They squeezed every second out of their days and did as much ibadat as possible. Unfortunately, in the West, we've got this mindset that we think we've got so much money, we'll do it again. We'll come again, we'll do this again, we'll do that again. Okay, maybe you've got so much money. And maybe you will have so much money, but have you got that life? Have you got that guarantee of life inside you? Just in these last four weeks myself, if I can tell you the funerals that I've attended in the last four weeks, I've attended the funeral of a 57-year-old, 33-year-old, 32-year-old, 41-year-old. No 70-year-olds, no 80-year-olds. Yes, they are dying as well, but I'm just giving you that this is, this is a reality. That people are dying at any age, at whatever age they are dying, and this is happening around us. Do you not realize that this is happening? I'm going to finish with something now. Last year in this country, the queen passed away. And when the queen passed away, her son became the king. And when the son became the king, it was written in the newspapers that he was born to be a king. He was born to be a king, and he waited all of his life to become a king. And it took him 70 years of his life to become a king. 70 years he could have become a king at 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70. 70 years of his life he waited to become a king. Why? Because he was born to be a king. What are we born to be? What are Muslims born to be? I'll tell you. In the same way that he is born to be a king, even that's a fallacy, that's a joke as well. We are born to die. That's what we're born to. We're born to die. And in the same way he could have been a king at 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, we can die at 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. In the same way he was preparing all his life, he spent all his life getting ready for the day that he was going to be king. We should be getting ready all our lives for the day that we're going to die. Because that is the only reality that we have. I don't know what time I'm going to get home tonight. I don't know what I'm going to eat tonight. I don't know anything about my future. But the only thing about my future I know is I'm going to die. And that is the only guarantee that you have in your life. And so you need to prepare for that. And as Muslims, the greatest gift that we have, the greatest gift that we have is our Iman. And so that is the one thing that we need to learn to protect. Because you can die a millionaire, you can die a billionaire. So what? But if you die without Iman, you're a failure. You failed. So we need to learn to protect our Iman. And what happens is we become engrossed in this dunya and we forget about this. You ask all these people that why are they working hard? Why do people want to become millionaires? They want to become millionaires so they can have peace in their life. They can have tranquility in their life. You know, there's a story I read recently on social media where there was a person in a boat, sitting there, relaxing in his boat. He was a fisherman. And someone said to him, what are you doing? He said, I'm, I'm, I'm chilling, I'm, I'm relaxing. And they said, why don't you catch more fish? And he said, and then? He said, when you catch more fish, you can have a bigger boat. And he said, and then? He said, when you get a bigger boat, you can have more people working for you. He said, and then? Then you can have a bigger boat. He said, and then? Then you can have two boats. And then you can have four boats. And then you can have ten boats. And then you can do this, and you can do it. And he said, and then? He kept saying, then, then, then. And at the end, the person said, and then you can relax. And he said, what am I doing now? What am I doing now? I'm relaxing. This is what I'm doing right now. If you want to find the richest person in the world, you won't find him on Google. The richest person in the world is the person that's happy with what Allah Azawajal has given him. And that's what we need to learn to do. We need to be happy with what Allah Azawajal has given us. And the problem now is we're not. Those people that are trying to become millionaires, they're trying to become millionaires so they can have peace. Ultimately, they think that by having money, I'll have a comfortable life. By having money, I'll have a comfortable life. But you see these people, they're on sleep, sleeping tablets. They can't sleep. They're that worried. 
The person that has a peaceful life is he who submits himself to Allah. Who's happy with whatever Allah has given us. And we need to learn to do that. We need to learn to accept what we've got. Be thankful for what we've got. Because what happens in our lives, we're constantly complaining. Why have I not got this? Why have I not got this? Why has he got a bigger car than me? Why has he got more kids than me? Why has he got more money than me? Why is his business more successful than me? And this why, this why culture, unless we're very careful, this why culture can take you to the boundaries of kufr. Because now you are questioning what Allah has given you, rather than thanking what Allah has given you. And one example I use literally everywhere I go, I'm going to use it again today is, if you want to realize how lucky you are, if you want to realize how lucky you are, when you go home today, do me a favor. Get your hand like this. Get your hand like this and put tape around your hand. Put tape around your hand and try and live your life like that for one hour. Try drinking a cup of tea. Try opening a door. Try doing many tasks. Within one hour, you'll realize how lucky you are that Allah gave you a thumb. Allah Akbar. What a beautiful thumb. How lucky I am that Allah has given me this thumb. And then you'll start to appreciate the blessings that Allah has given you. We've not talked about the eyes, we've not talked about the tongue, the ears, the fact that I can stand up, the fact that I can walk out, the fact that I can go to the toilet, the fact that I can drink, the fact that I can eat. All of these, we just talked about a thumb. And with one hour, you'll realize, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, don't take this thumb away from me. Ya Allah, I'm so fortunate, so blessed that you give me these things. We need to learn to be thankful to Allah. We need to learn to be content. We need to learn to prepare ourselves for that day. And we need to live our lives in such a way that we are going to die in such a way that die with Iman. So my dear Islam brothers and viewers of the channel, we are in these 10 days of Zul Hajj. I pray to Allah that we take as much benefit from these 10 days as possible. Not only just from these 10 days, but have a wider look at our deen and be fortunate about our deen and take the blessings from our deen and put ourselves into the deen. You know, we see around us now that on every street corner, everywhere, shaitan is trying to take our iman away from us. Shaitan is trying to take the iman away from our children. I don't have to tell you what's happening in the schools, what's happening in the colleges, what's happening on the streets, what's happening when the sun sets. You all know what's happening. What are we going to do about it? What are we going to do about it to protect our iman? To protect the iman of our children? We need to make a change. And Dawah Islam is here to help us make that change. Dawah Islam is here to protect oneself and help to protect others. And that's the mission statement, that I must strive to rectify myself and strive to rectify the people of the whole world. Rectify yourself, improve yourself, protect yourself, protect your family. Safeguard their iman. You know, this is the beautiful masjid. Outside it looks beautiful masjid, inside it's a beautiful masjid. But the beauty of the masjid is not in the carpet, it's not in the lighting. Mashallah, what a beautiful room we're here. The beauty of the masjid is in the namazi. You can spend a million pounds on this room. But if it's empty, it's not a beautiful masjid. This could have paint falling off the floor, off the walls. They could have no lights in it, but if this masjid is full, it's beautiful. That's the beauty of the masjid. And it's our job to make sure the masjid is beautiful. And that beauty is not by expensive carpets. That masjid is beautiful by the people that are in it. So let's make sure we make the masjid beautiful. Let's make sure we put in place those things to protect our iman. I mentioned earlier on Nigrani Shura Haji Imran, the head of the executive cabinet of Dawson. I'm going to finish with this. He said to us that people here nowadays, we are the motorway builders of the Ummah of the future. And I'll explain. I came down the M6. I was driving at 70 miles an hour. I wasn't breaking the law, honest. I was driving at 70 miles an hour. But that motorway, 70 miles in one hour, 70 miles of motorway was not made in one hour. Maybe one mile of motorway took 70 days to make. One mile of motorway might have taken 70 days to make. But when they made it, they struggled, they strived, the rain, the sleet, the snow, they came across big stones, all sorts of problems. They made it so that future generations can travel at 70 miles an hour. We, our job today is to put in place those institutes, those schools, those jamias, those madrasas, those masjids, to work hard today so that the future generation can travel on these motorways that we've provided. This is our job. And I pray to Allah Azza wa Jalla that we can all work together to safeguard our Iman and the Iman of our future generations. I pray to Allah Azza wa Jalla if I've said anything wrong, may Allah Azza wa Jalla forgive me. And I pray to Allah Azza wa Jalla that Allah give me and you the ability to think about what I've said, to act upon what I've said, and to pass it on to others as well. Ameen bijahin nabi lameen. Sallu ala al Habib. <laughs> May you keep 
ascending me success Say it, oh, balik for you is my prayer May you keep ascending me success